It We're does. getting a lot of mileage out of this. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Greg Hain. I'm with uh, Ryan Groff. And uh, we're hosting this third episode of Unlocking Service Growth. And the purpose of this webinar series is to interview the best service contractors and, and people in the industry that have demonstrated a capability to build great service organizations or support that process. And so uh, Ryan is going to introduce our guest today. Ryan? Yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, for those of you who don't know Greg Hain, we co-host this program together, and he's a dear friend, an amazing coach, and somebody if you're not working with, you need to be. So uh, as everyone's getting settled in, I first want to introduce, before we introduce our special guest, I want to introduce uh, our, our sponsor, Follow Up CRM. And Greg, Greg Wallach and Eric Vargas have worked together on this company for several years together, and they're doing great things. I'm going to play a quick demo video and then I'm gonna pass it off to Eric for a few moments before we get started. So I'm gonna do that now and share and go right into it. And here we are. Are you a contractor using spreadsheets to manage sales and estimating? Maybe you are using a software system, but the CRM just doesn't measure up. If that's you, you are probably struggling to keep organized and feel like you are living in spreadsheet hell. Getting the critical reports you need to run your business is a pain. You might be frustrated that leads and bids are falling through the cracks. Customers are not taken care of. Nothing is tracked. And if it is not tracked, it cannot be managed. Spreadsheets are no way to manage your business. You know this. It is time for a change. And Follow Up CRM is here to help. We specialize in helping contractors get off spreadsheets and get organized in our software to get the reports they need to run a profitable sales and estimating team at your business. At Follow Up CRM, we believe power comes from simplicity. So we built Follow Up CRM for minimum data input and maximum sales output to help you build strong customer relationships. One of our clients recently said, because of the organization Follow Up CRM creates within our team, we are able to identify and focus on bidding to the clients that are awarding us jobs. Our closing ratio went from 10% to 25% in less than a year. We bid less and win more. So it's time to take your business to the next level and stop using spreadsheets to manage leads, bids, and clients. Click the button and schedule a call today. Follow up CRM, bid less, win more. Are you a contractor using spreadsheets to manage sales? All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Eric Vargas with Follow Up CRM. Super happy to sponsor this webinar with you guys here today. You might hear Follow Up CRM's name being mentioned throughout this webinar. Greg Wallach at Best Roofing, he's one of our clients. And uh, Ryan and Greg have definitely been familiar with our CRM and how we are helping the industry uh, manage their leads, bids, and clients in one easy place. Um, I'm going to be here um, to answer any questions that you might have around follow-up CRM. If you're interested in taking a look um, or having a call with me, I'm going to post a link in the chat that you can click on and schedule some time with me. Uh, we are having a special offer for people who are attending this webinar. So if you're interested in taking advantage of that offer for the end of the month, let me know. I'd be happy to schedule some time with you. So I'm going to post that link in the chat, but I'm thankful to be here and uh, to support this meeting today. Cool. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll jump right in. So let me introduce our guest, uh, Greg Wallach, Best Roofing. Uh, Greg has uh, personally uh, brought me into this industry. So if you guys are being impacted by what we're doing at STG, it literally was birthed and incubated uh, with the relationship with Greg. Uh, Greg showed me what it's like to become a professional and to learn sales and learn service. And he's personally just, he literally has changed my life and therefore he's changing yours. Um, so it's a real honor to have Greg spend some time sharing his wisdom. Uh, he is the best. I mean, not no pun intended. He's the best in the game. Uh, there's very few that can that's doing what he's doing at the level he's doing it in the nation. And so uh, this is a really special opportunity for for me and for everybody here to 
spend a few moments with Greg Wallach of Best Roofing. And so um, I'm looking forward to introducing him. But before we do, I know Greg wants to speak to the relationship shortly as well. And my relationship with Greg has gone on for, I don't know, probably five, six, seven years. And um, often in my work with contractors, I'll take a, I'll call Greg on the phone and say, Greg, I got a, I have a peer group of contractors that I'd like to come down and see how you do things. And he always says, sure, when, and we get it arranged. And it's not like we're there. Greg personally supervises. We basically spend a half a day there and he's with us with much of that time. He's taking personal time to help these contractors get better. And um, that kind of dedication to the industry needs mention. And so um, Greg, I, I will thank you for that on behalf of all the people that you've helped that I know about. And before I turn this back to Ryan, I want to point out that we are going to have time for questions. And if you start, if you have a question, type it into the chat box or into the Q&A box now, or as you have them, don't wait till the end. So with that, Ryan, go ahead. Yep. So uh, to, to speed up a long introduction, Greg uh, has been in the industry over 30, maybe 40 years and in commercial roofing specifically on a national scale. He was, uh, he pulled off a roll up in the nineties and early two thousands, and he's been on the roofing contract in magazines several times. He's spoken at conferences, uh, but really when, what's powerful about what Greg has done in the past decade, right at the end of the recession, I remember what Greg told me, I just got laser focused on service. And what he has today is in 2020, a $13.5 million service department and revenue in one tri-county area in South Florida. And so what I'd like to do, Greg, is I just ask you to speak a little bit about um, that journey. And what we're going to do is talk about some of the areas you got stuck and how you and your team has overcome that. And then Greg and I will ask you a few more questions. So Greg, thanks again for coming on and uh, welcome. Hey, Ryan, thanks. It's, on, it's an honor to be able to speak to uh, your, your group of people here. So um, let me first just kind of start off. Um, you know, a lot of contractors kind of avoid service because service is hard. It's hard to manage. Um, and I remember when I first started doing it and I said, you know, what we're doing is majoring in minors. We got all these small little jobs that we're going to try to do. And then you, you, you try to keep everybody happy. And, um, and it's complicated. And the reason that there's not a lot of, you know, big service businesses is because it's, it's harder, much harder to run than a contracting uh, business. At, at Best Roofing, uh, this last year, we did about 7,000 service transactions. Um, now, you know, when, I, when we first started getting serious about, about service, um, was, was in the recession, people weren't buying roofs. Um, I, I had to stay alive um, and we just started focusing and marketing to service. And, and, what I, and what I've done is I've transformed my whole company. I've gotten out of new construction um, and I, we only do roof replacement, repairs and, and restoration. Um, and all of our marketing is focused on the roof uh, repair and restoration and maintenance side of the business, but it, nobody wants to talk about re-roofing. Um, so, uh, about 2010 was when we, we kind of hit a ceiling. We, we were growing and, you know, we had a, two trucks, then we got the four trucks, then we got the six trucks and the eight trucks and we hit 10 trucks and all of a sudden it was like, bam, we just couldn't get, we couldn't get past 10 trucks. And um, I ended up hiring a consultant to come in and, and help me just identify, you know, wh what's happened and what he, what he, advised me was, he says, you, you just don't have the infrastructure to process everything. And, and we were having some real issues. We were, it was taking us like weeks to get invoices out. We were, we were busy, but the, the systems and the processes that we had in place just weren't functioning right. And, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about any of those because they're, they're, they're all still around right now. Uh, and I don't want to say anything about bad about anybody, but we have some systems that just weren't working for us. And then, and, and we went out and, and went on a search and found what we thought was the best operational system for, uh, the, for the roofing industry 
at that time. And that was in uh, 2011. And uh, it took us about six months to get that system uh, implemented. And we were running parallel to the system that we were on. But once that happened, it just really uh, streamlined our processes and our procedures. And we were saying, okay, now that we can now that we can handle the operational aspect of it, let's think about how we're going to grow it. And um, and then we sat down and just started becoming really strategic about um, how do how do we grow a service business? Because so much of service is rain driven. You know, you, you, we we all have all the business we need when it's raining. But when it stops raining, how do we keep our crews busy and how do we how do we uh, grow our business? Um, and so what I've learned is that there's there's three primary products that that we sell and, uh, and that we've identified. And I think this really probably applies to, to anybody who's trying to get into the um, roofing service business is you're going to have what we call maintenance agreements. You're going to have um, what we call emergency repairs or time. We call them T&Ms. And then the other thing we have is what we call scope jobs. And uh, a scope job is where somebody actually goes out, gets up on the roof, diagnoses what the issues are, uh, writes a proposal, and then sits down with a client and, and walks them through that uh, proposal. Um, so when you look, I, I think you have to just get really serious about identifying and say, what do those three products look like? And then we started mapping out, okay, how do we, how do we price out those? Those products, and then how do we how do we train uh, our people to service those products? And what we what what we've found, and this has been um, this has been plus or minus a couple of percent every year. About eighty percent of our service business is actually sold service business. About twenty percent is maintenance agreements and um, and just emergency repairs. You're, you're never gonna grow your service business if you don't have a structured sales team that's out soliciting and working small jobs. And um, what we find uh, is our average small job that we're selling is really around $5,000. And and we found that, that if you can keep it within $5,000, that's a kind of a magic number that a lot of people have the authority to pull the trigger on. But when you get when you get larger jobs, um, then all of a sudden things get more competitively bid out, and um, it takes a little bit more um, scrutiny for somebody to sign sign a contract over five thousand dollars. So our guys know that, and um, and we we try to uh, you know stay in that range with our clients, uh, and but depending on what they need too. I don't want I don't want you to think that I'm trying to misrepresent what's needed on a roof, but that's something that, that we've identified. Um, we, um, we have very, very specific training for those salespeople. Um, right now we're running seven salespeople. And um, one of the things that, that was a big plus for us to supplement our sales force was we, we um, about two years ago, we put what we call a BDC, which is a business development coordinator, um, an inside person that would do um, all of the administrative work for the, the guys who are out uh, crawling roofs, at, uh, doing their surveys, doing their estimates, um, where we had an administrative person assisting them with um, their uh, proposals, their follow-ups, their appointments. Um, and we found that that by get, we, we have, um, for every salesperson, we have, um, a, a, or for every two to three salespeople, we have an administrative support person for them. And that really uh, helped out and improved our closing ratio. Um, on our scope jobs, we're, we're closing today, six out of 10. For, for every 10 calls we make, we'll close six of those, but, uh, about a 60% uh, uh, closing ratio. Um, we have a very structured pricing methodology. Uh, we, every, every one of our guys who go out um, will look at something and it'll get priced this, the same way. Um, we have a very tight um, CRM system, the follow-up system that uh, 
does a lot of goal setting. It does workflow coordination between if there if there's more than one person working on on a project, it it allows us to to communicate electronically, um, and really keep keep our records. Um, I'm a I'm a fanatic about goal setting. You know, let, let's define what success is going to look like, and then let's measure against that. And um, when we uh, when it gets down to like what an expectation uh, from a service truck, and then what's the expectation from a um, a salesperson is we we look at every two man crew should be able to generate a half a million dollars worth of business. That's what we're generating today. Now, I'm not gonna tell you we were always at that. I mean, when we first started out, we were around $200,000 per truck with a two man. But um, we really tightened up our efficiencies and, and, uh, and we're seeing a half a million dollars come out of each truck now. Um, that, that's kind of big picture stuff. Ryan, uh, Greg, if, if you guys have some questions you wanna ask. Um, I'm all for it. I, I want to ask a question that um, goes back to a conversation you and I had um, many years ago when you brought in that software. And what you told me was, you know, you said to me, we got two Gregs here. This will get confusing. But you said, Greg, I basically took six months off and learned that software myself to understand how to use it. And in my work with contractors, one of the things that I see that doesn't happen is I don't see the boss, you, getting involved at that level. Would you, could you talk about why you felt the need to take six months off from your business in order to learn this software and what would happen if you hadn't done that? Well, I, I'm not going to take it, tell you I took six months off from everything. Here's what I ended up doing. I took every Friday and Saturday for six months. And I just rolled up my sleeves and um, helped the people who were configuring. Because anytime you buy a software platform, you've got to get it configured. You got to build it around how you want to do business. And um, the majority of the time that I was spending on was um, we identified like 200 different deficiencies. Um, you know, like we we had we had a picture of something, and and we really wordsmith those deficiencies. So we made it easy for somebody to grab a picture. If they saw a picture, they could grab that verbiage. And then we had uh, wordsmith the corrective actions associated with fixing that deficiency. So what we did was we made it really easy for our, our salespeople to make sure that they have diagnosed the right thing and that they are, are writing the right prescription to, to remedy that. And then depending on the, on the, the size and complexity of it, we we built a, uh, an estimating template around each deficiency so that um, we had a lot of consistency there. And, and what it did was it allowed us to train our people by showing them a picture. Okay, this is what, you know, reflashing a drain looks like. This is what redoing a scupper looks like. This is what um, reflashing a pipe or, or, or fixing a puncture looks like. And then we had all the words are already so that, um, whoever was selling that would, would sell it the right way. And, and, and here, here's, here's what I've learned about this business. It's the people who make the fewest mistakes are going to be the people who are going to win. You just got to figure out how you, how you can avoid making mistakes and, uh, and redoing stuff and keeping, keeping clients happy. Yeah. Uh, Greg, as a, I love that the, the goal setting and me as a, as an athlete, baseball player, you as a University of Miami football player, I love the way our relationship formed because we're both so aggressive toward achieving something. And that's, that's quite frankly, what it's like at best roofing. It might as well be, uh, it feels like you're a part of a professional sports team, but it's, you got the scoreboard everywhere, but, but it's roofing. Um, one thing that I, that I talk about a lot is, is just having a reliable system and having a culture and an environment that attracts people to be successful. And I, and one thing that you've spoken to me about often throughout the years is build a really good system and then teach the people to run the system. And you've, I've found that you've been able to succeed so much despite having really talented people, some decently talented people, some 
maybe even below average at times, but then, but you attract a lot of high performers, but you're not having to rely on these rock stars to do everything. And I think that a lot of people struggle uh, with that because there's, there's drama that comes with that. Uh, and I think that if you could speak to just the, the mindset and the importance of the system, and I think we could talk about the estimating side, we could talk about sales and that, all that. Would you just speak to how you have designed like an architect just piecing together this system? So when someone comes in, I mean, they got a guy who's 23 years old, just finished a, a FAU. It was, he's a great guy. Somebody, you know, a business owner, it's their son. And they can come right in and start putting points on the board. How, how do you do that? Like, how does somebody do that with, and can you speak a little bit to that with uh, specifically, I would say around a service salesperson uh, or anybody else in your service department? Well, w- what we've done is we've, and, and, and I'm going to talk about the 80%. Okay. The, the maintenance agreements and the emergency stuff that that's another story um, where you're going to win big in service is selling small service jobs. Um, going out and servicing people's client, uh, people's roofs. Um, I, I have always run my businesses around build a system to run the business, teach somebody how to run the system. So like for, for our service scope jobs is what we call them. We've identified 24 steps. There's 24 steps from the time that a call comes in until we get it collecting that, that final invoice that, that take place in a service transaction. And, and that goes, you know, each one of those 24 steps, what we've done is we've defined that we have an online teaching platform that uh, somebody could log into and then um, get up to speed on understanding the concept behind uh, what you're expected to do, whether it's this is how you do a takeoff, this is how you put your ladder up on the building, um, you know, this is how you address a client. This is the this is the way you should talk to a client. A lot of the stuff that, that that Ryan is teaching is stuff that we do day in and day out with our guys, just making sure that you know they're excellent at pre-qualifying. Um, pre-qualification, I think, is probably one of the most important aspects of identifying who am I going to work with and who am I not going to work with. Um, so what we've done is we've identified all of those steps and then. We, we train to those and it's like anything else, you know, you, you get better with practice, you know, you're not going to be, you know, a top performer coming out of the shoot. But if you have a blueprint, if you have a roadmap that says, this is how we do it at best roofing, um, it, it, it happens much better and much quicker. Now, here's what, here's what we like to do. Very rarely do we bring in somebody with a lot of roofing experience. What we found is, um, what we really are looking for is we're looking for, for people and you're not hearing this just from me. I mean, this is, this is just kind of like business one-on-one, one-on-one. You, you hire people that got great character, people that, that are honest, that are trustworthy. Um, it's easier to teach somebody roofing than it is how to behave. And, and I find if I hire good people that just behave right, um, we can teach them the roofing aspect pretty quick. And, and what we found is it usually takes us about 90 days to get a, um, an unseasoned roofing person uh, up to where they're able to go out on calls by themselves. Um, and we have a very structured onboarding process where we, we actually, if somebody doesn't have roofing experience, um, we have them ride with, a, with somebody in a, in a service truck for the first 30 days and actually see what do, the, what do you do on a roof? How do you, how do you, you know, find a leak? Um, what's what's my, the proposal look like? How does how do the people interpret that my proposal when they get it and they're and they're asked to go perform something? So after they um, after they've been up on the roof in, for 30 days, then we have them just ride along with uh, with somebody shadowing and making sure that they uh, go in and visit with clients and just hear. Uh, and we take our you know our better performers to to do the shadowing. Um, and then like the last 30 days, um, we'll send them out uh, with a manager or somebody and let them start pitching and then, and then debrief with, with them afterwards. So, you know, uh, you got to, you know, and, and you got to think long term, you know, <laughs> it, 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 this is not a quick fix. If you want good people, you got to 
you got to pour into them. You got to be willing to invest in them. And then, you know, uh, that hopefully they're going to stay with you for a long time. All right. I have three questions for you. One is what are the ranges of a sales performer in service with their relation to their, their revenue they're bringing in or sales annually or per month it's up to you. I'd love to hear that from the, this to the norm. If norm's still there, uh, I know he was a machine. Um, and then I want you to talk to the re-roofing once do you, are you handing off? You've tinkered quite a bit over the years. Does that account manager sell the re-roof with somebody or do they hand it off? And then thirdly, uh, I want to talk about your, your lead generation model because a lot of folks are not in a position where they have the brand momentum that best does where leads fly through the door and it's the best re-roofing service market up there, top three in the nation, South Florida, where it rains often, it's very densely populated. So I think we could talk a little bit more on that, but I want to, the first two questions, ranges of production. So somebody can get a sense of a South Florida best roofing sales guy. What, what are they putting on? What points do they put on the board? Re-roofing then brand. Um, the first full year that somebody's working, we're, we're hoping that they're going to hit somewhere between 800 and a million dollars. Um, and, and that's with us providing them the majority of their leads. Now, what ends up happening on the service and the service side of the business um, is a service salesperson starts accumulating clients. Like for us, we're in the commercial business. We'll have a, a client that'll have 10 or 15 properties. And if you earn their trust on that first property, then they, they let you get access to the next one. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you're like their guy, just like, you know, not, I don't think many of us change dentists very often. I mean, you go to a dentist, you have somebody clean your teeth, as long as they're not put inflicting too much pain on you, you go back for another, another round. Well, that's kind of what it is like with, with your, a, a roofing service person is when, when a property manager or a property owner can get somebody that they trust that that's doing them a good service and making their roof last, they start trusting them. And so a, 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 a good salesperson will start building a book of business of clients. Now, our top producer, this is somebody who's been with me for 20 years. Um, he's, uh, he's, this last year, he produced uh, a little north of three and a half million dollars. Um, but I want to tell you, he's got such an amazing client base. He's, he's not taking on hardly any new leads. He's just servicing a, a, a great client base of people who have multiple properties who just trust him. And he, his closing ratio is very high because he's taking more, he's taking orders more than he's making sales. Yeah. And you guys, uh, just a quick pivot around north of 50% on your margins. People are asking that somewhere, yeah. somewhere there on the scope work or is the entire department or it's a we, higher we, on the we scope. Find, we find our, our time and material work um, is a little under 50% sometimes. And it's just because you have to negotiate sometimes your rates. And we've got some, some larger accounts that we, we negotiated down our rates. So our margins are a little less on the time and material business. Um, um, our, maintenance, our maintenance business uh, has, has probably the highest margin um, on it. Uh, but it, again, it's small. It's, it's smaller a, it's volume. A small component. Yeah. Small volume, high margin. Um, our scope, scope of work. Um, it depends on the size of the job and the complexity of the job and who the client is, you know, you just got to feel it out. Um, you know, but we, we like, to, we like to try to earn greater than 50% on our, on our service. Now you compensate the salespeople to sell service. And I, and I think that's very brilliant. And I think it's a best practice that I, I try to instill with our customers that work with uh, me, but you got this situation where you have the re-roofing, right? That's a big, that's a different animal to them. They don't see that as often. Can you speak to how you coach your team to handle those opportunities and do you switch the account manager? Do they just get supported by the sales leader and an estimator? How does that work for you guys when you have this service momentum with these account managers, but then now it's time to re-roof or they're giving advice to re-roof? What do you do? 
Now, I, I, have a, I have a market down here that's a little different than most markets. I, I live in the most code restrictive, permit intense, inspection world that you could ever imagine. And anybody who, who thinks they wanna come to South Florida, you better, you better think twice before you come down here and deal with these uh, inspectors and these building, building officials. And I, I'm telling you right now with COVID and stuff, it's taken us three and four months to get permits sometimes. It's just nuts. But um, because of the complexity, um, our service guys, we kind of lean towards service uh, and let them just stay there. And, and we, we position it where we're bringing in a roof replacement expert because our stuff is so heavily engineered down here where we have to do uplift calculations, drainage calculations, they have bestest calculations. There's just so many things that go into the design that um, we, um, we just kind of do a, a pass the baton, uh, unless unless the it, the situation just really warrants it, and the client is like, just give me a price. I love you. You're my guy. You're gonna do it. So we we kind of separate the two, uh, and uh, we pay our we pay our people a high enough base salaries so that um, they can make a living, and then we bonus them after that based on on how they do. Um, mm -hmm. So you know. I, I, I hate I hate being totally commission driven. It, I, I found it hasn't worked well for me. Um, well, you evolved as your business gained momentum, and I think that has a ton to do with your brand positioning as at Best Roofing. And and so, um, if we could spend just a minute here, I know Greg might have a question, and we can field some from the group. Um, we have some customers that are in a different type of market and their salespeople are prospecting right now. They don't have the accounts that you guys have that's generating 7,000 orders, you know, and they're just working with Norm. Norman Taylor's got doing three and a half million. They're, they're, hunt, they're hunting right now. But what I've noticed with you is that as the owner, you are, are, are a great salesperson and a great marketer down there. And not every owner has those gifts, but there is somebody in every organization that can be an incredible educator and can speak to the market on an educational level. You guys do every organic outburst, every organic branding method possible with everything you do. And you've done a great job with that. Um, speak to how long that takes if you're just consistent with your relational brand and, and hitting their relational networking and sponsoring and, and this service model, when did it really start to hit a flywheel for you where leads start flying through the door and account managers just have leads coming in? Because I think there's, that's a long-term play that you're reaping the rewards of because you stayed focused, but a lot of folks aren't making those commitments on the brand and the marketing side. And they're just kind of prospecting only. And, and it's a little bit of everything. It's a lot of everything. Can you speak to, the timeline of that flywheel effect with your brand and just some of the things that you had to do over the years to position yourself at best roofing as somebody that they think of when they have a leak. That, that, what you, you nailed it there, Ryan. It, it's, it's, you got to have top of mind awareness because nobody just picks up the phone or comes in one day and says, you know, I think I want to just go fix a roof leak. You know, it, it, it's always an event driven Kind of activity, so um, you gotta you gotta like be as visible as possible, and um, you know that that's one of the things that we've done is we've just become as visible as we possibly can. We we are really fanatical about our, our equipment and and it being on the on the road, and it always is shiny. It's always clean. It's consistent. Um, if a truck gets a dent in it, you know we're we're pretty fanatical about about getting it out. We post signs on projects. Um, we've got um, 22 um, roadside billboards, you know, those things that says, I sponsor the highway type things. We've got those everywhere. Um, we have uh, two digital marketing people on staff that are just uh, doing, I, I, I'll do like these, I'll do um, 30 to 40 classes a year where I teach um, how to make your roof last longer, um, how to, how to, if you had to replace your roof, this is the, this is how you would go about it. And then hurricane preparedness. So, um, my marketing group is getting me in front of property managers, um, 40 times a year, um, 
to, to just talk and teach uh, on how to make roofing decisions. Um, we used to, prior to COVID, we used to be very active on the trade, trade show and association networks. That's, that's kind of gone its way. But what we've done is we've gone to a digital platform. We built a TV studio like I'm sitting in right now and um, we're doing presentations to clients now in a very professional way with a, uh, a software program that allows us to put um, our proposals and stuff up on one screen and then uh, talk on the other screen. So just trying to be a little bit more professional than our competition in the way that we, um, that we go to market um, it has been big. If I could jump in here for a second, um, I'd like to point out to everyone that we have spent almost no time talking about roof leaks. Service is what you do for your customers. And if you think about everything that Greg has been saying, it's all about building relationships with customers. He has built a TV studio in his offices in order to make sure that the quality of communication he's generating is high quality. Now, if you're a small contractor, you can't do that. But the, we're talking about a forward thinking contractor here. And yes, Ryan, I have a whole bunch of questions I could ask, but I've been very content to sit here because Greg is laying out very nicely all of the pieces. And this is very much a sales driven organization and you're not gonna get the 13 and a half million dollars by fixing leaks. You've gotta build relationships. And he does, th their organization does a brilliant job of it. All of these uh, little pieces contribute to that. Greg, go ahead. Are you gonna throw um, Okay, so 81% of our leads come from an existing client or a referral on the service side, okay? So here's what, it, it's all about building a relationship with somebody and then just growing that relationship and, and just keeping it year after year after year and building on top of it and, and just being crazy about customer service and about um, solving complaints and, and, and just keeping a client. I mean, this is one of the things that I, that I say to our service managers. Some, sometimes, you know, somebody will call and they say it's leaking again in the same place and we go out and, and it's not leaking in the same place. It's leaking someplace else, but, you know, they're sitting in an office somewhere and they're translating this. And what we found is at the end of the day, I, I'd rather not get into an argument with a client about something I, you know, okay, let's say it cost me an extra two, 300 bucks to fix that. But I, I, I look at the, the value of that client over the next like five years and how many roof leaks I might be able to fix for them, how many scope jobs I could do, how many roof replacements. And I look at that $300 and I just say, you know what, if you, if you really think that we're wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to you. And that, that's kind of how I've coached my service operations people to deal with clients. And, and you know who the, who, who the ones who are going to, you know, try to take advantage of you because they just go to the well too many times. But once, once a client uh, trusts you, once you earn somebody's trust, then you can start building a real serious business around that. Um, I want to, Greg just said 81% of their customers come through the service store. He knows that number. And if you want to build a service organization, you need to know those numbers. He didn't have to look it up. He knows it. You need to do that. That's part of the game. And that's, that's where, you know, follow-up CRM is a great example. Oh yeah. It's I, a, I literally uh, demoed follow-up CRM <laughs> thousands of times <laughs> over four and a half years. And uh, I use best roofing as a demonstration. Uh, Eric will gladly show you how quickly and easy you can generate the reporting you need to have confidence in doubling down on the next thing, doubling down on this client, taking those steps, knowing your numbers, knowing your closing ratio. I want to talk about predictability and then we're going to go rapid fire Q and a like bing, bang, boom. So like, like we're going to try to be quick. Um, predictability. If you, if someone were to come by your business or someone, or even if you wanted to grow your business, the, the, the degree of how predictable your business is makes it more valuable, makes it more exciting, gives you more confidence. Can you talk to how 
uh, when I met with you 2013, you were able to show me with the data and with that you can look at things, not, not emotionally, but objectively and forecast the future and be able to actually hit it. And, and it's incredible. You're, you have, you have paid off buildings, you know, team of leaders you have, it's amazing what, where you are in your career and being able to predict your growth has allowed that to happen. How can, how are you able to predict re revenue? I know this is a lot of things, uh, a lot of variables that make that happen, but give me the bottom line. Listen, I'm going to make it really simple for you. It, our, we have a goal every week that we want to bring in 86 service leads that go to our guys who go out and crawl roofs and put quotes on. Now, what we've learned is out of those 86, 86 leads that we get, about 24% of those do not get proposals. Some of them just go to time and material repairs. Some of them, are just, they're, just not, they're just not a good fit. So we, we, we get that and we discount that by 24%. And then we know that, that six out of 10 proposals we're gonna win. So we're just fanatical about tracking leads and, and, and making sure we got leads coming in. Um, and then we know what our closing ratio is. And we know if we put for every 10 proposals that we put out, we get six. So, you know, once you've got that, and you referenced it flywheel effect, once you got that stuff coming in on a regular basis, and once you've built your brand, um, it becomes extremely predictable. Like, you know, right now we're forecasting. Um, and, it, and let me tell you this, it's really hard to grow big and fast in service. We're forecasting this year um, that we hope to grow 10%. And, um, you know, it's uh, a lot of it's going to depend just on how rainy it is. Last year was a pretty rainy season for us down here. And uh, we did really well. I mean, we were about 18% ahead of where we were the year before. Um, but, you know, it all starts with tracking your leads and having your analytics. And, and you know, you got to have a system, you know, I'm, I'm partial to follow up because I, you know, I, I was involved in building it and I, and I built it around how I run this service business. So, you know, but once, once you get a, a project or a client logged in, then you, you got, just got to be able to follow that through the system and understand. Oh, and here's the other thing, too. Most contractors are just atrocious about, about tracking their pipelines. They don't, they, you know, they, they put a quote out and, and they call on it once or they call on it twice and then they forget about it and the file's just sitting somewhere. We're, we are fanatical about following up um, with, our, with our clients and being able to stay in touch with them and building a relationship with them. And just your, sales people, your salespeople just follow up by themselves though, right? They don't need to be managed and held accountable. No, because because the system the system measures that it lets us know when they followed up or when they were supposed to follow up. Um, exactly. And 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 here here's the other thing too, share the information. We've got a big TV screen in in, in uh, our sales office that has how many deals we closed uh, for the day, for the week, for the month, for the year, and then every one of the guys can see the, a report card and what a homepage on how they're doing in relationship to their peers. And there is nothing that drives performance more than a peer-driven organization where the guys just, they're looking over their shoulder saying, okay, how's he doing? How am I doing? And they compete and they compete, you know, so fun. and have a lot of fun at it. Absolutely. Yeah. So Greg Hain, we have questions in chat and in Q and A. I think we should, you should pick one and go and I'll be ready with the other. Can we do that? Sure. So All right. Let's um, be quick. Greg, are you using infrared scans in your roof maintenance proposals? Um, sometimes when we have a concrete deck where um, we, about every five years, we like to do a, a moisture survey on a concrete deck because water can be getting into the system and we might not, it might not be getting into the roof are you know so it, mostly concrete decks uh will do that and a follow-up from the same person are you charging a customer to do a roof inspection um we say we do but then we give them away um 
you know, we, we let them know that this is a, a chargeable thing, but for you, we're, you know, we're going to do it. Ryan. Okay. Uh, you say in the Q and a, I'm going to go in the chat. Okay. Uh, how, go ahead, Greg, continue on. The, okay. On the so <clears throat> what are the lead expectations, behavior expectations, Greg, for a sales uh, person, daily activities, so forth and so on. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for our guys to be crawling two to three roofs a day. Um, you know, it depends, it just depends on how mature of a book of business they have. Cause, um, that, that's what happens with us is somebody gets a client base over time and then those clients just feed him and the, and the newer leads go to the newer, the newer guys. And if you've got somebody that's has no book of business. And um, I heard you say you're feeding them stuff, but if they're, if they're going to have to generate some of their own, or do they have to generate their own stuff? Are you generating everything for them? We're generating everything for them. We, we've got such a lead generation marketing okay. machine here that, that we're able to do that. But listen, we've got, um, I think six people in our, on our marketing group, you know, a couple of digital people, a couple uh, that, that are, that do the TV stuff with me um, and the video stuff. And then we, um, I got to send you these new, these new cartoons that we're sending out. Um, we, I, I, I'll give you a, a, for instance, we had two guys like out, out by a railroad track and they were talking, talking about new year's and what, you know, they're, they're chumming it up. They got cowboy hats on and everything. And, they, and a guy's got a, a bottle of whiskey in his hand and the other guy, he goes, all right, you ready? Three, two, one, happy new year. And he shoots the gun up in the air and the guys take a swig of it. And then, and then it, it, it flashes to one of our service guys over on a roof, digging a bullet out of the roof going, another guy shot his gun up in the air, you know, bullets do fall down. So we, we you know, we're doing stuff like that to just kind of, you know, bring a little bit of humor to our, we got a, a mailing list, an emailing list that's been organically built. It's about uh, 18,000 uh, really bona fide, solid, you know, client friends of ours. But we're doing stuff, you know, stuff like that. Um, we have two business development ladies that uh, when we when we realized how much of our business was coming from existing clients, we really market to our existing clients and look at it. How can we preserve those existing clients? Because every client, you got to look at them as a, as a referral resource. And I would rather put my money into my relationships with my clients than I would trying to find somebody new. So if you are going to go out, start over today, and you're going to start targeting customers to call on, are you going to call on property managers, building owners? What's your target market going to be? Knowing what you know now, I, I would I would go after people who make roofing decisions over a large group of properties consistently, you know, and and uh, and it, it, you know, this goes back to I remember remember when I first got in the business in the business and uh, this guy uh, he was a property manager and um, I tell this story uh, about the school bus and stuff, but um, I, I'm going to make it short because I know we're on a t short time frame. Um, I had this property manager. He just, he thought, he thought I was just the greatest because I uh, would respond to him so quickly and stuff. And, um, and he said to me, he says, you know, you're, you're just the most, the best service provider I've ever had in my whole life and everything. And I walk out of his office and I kind of said to myself, and you know what, you're my only client. I've been sitting there waiting for you to call me for like, you know, every day. So you just got to build a client base, you know, one client at a time. And then just, make sure that they are just so fanatically thrilled with what you've done and they feel like you're working for them and, and that you are working for them. And then, and, um, quick, quick, quick question, Greg, uh, what's the name of the software program you're utilizing to pitch the proposals while you're on the call? Is it zoom or is it another program? We use a program called Demio Demio. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, I'm not the expert at, at that stuff. Zoom might do it, but we found that uh, our, our people that made that decision early in the year liked Demio. Okay. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about paying salespeople. Um, I, I know that 
I learned that from you and I, I help consult that with people who work with me. Um, can you just high level, how do you pay your, your account managers, those seven that you have currently on the service side? We have a livable base salary. And then based on the gross margin that they earn, they get bonus twice a year. And it's based on uh, a percentage of the gross margin. Okay. Um, curious, people are asking about your corporate, your total revenues. And I think it's good to just share the split and where your gross profit margin is coming from, you, you, uh, if you don't mind, just because we, many people are doing this. They realize service drives the re-roofing and that's a huge part of your business. Can you just speak to the split and the margins real fast? Um, what we found historically is that service is about 20% of our business and roof replacement is about 80%. And whatever, it, it just kind of stays right in that area for us. So we, we, we our business was off 6% this year um, between you know all of the nonsense with COVID and the shutdowns. And we had a really unusual rainy season this year, it rained a little bit more. Our business was off 6%, but we're forecasting this year to be a, you know, a, a really good growth year. There's a, uh, and, yeah. there's, there's a question that's popped up a couple places in different ways in here uh, about office infrastructure. And I'm taking that uh, internal office staffing to support the operations. So this would not be the revenue generation side. This is the service superintendents, the coordinators. What kind of, how does that look? What does that look like to support? And how many trucks do you have? Um, we've got 28 trucks and, and, and they're, Sometimes they're fully staffed and then sometimes like this time of year, which is the dry time of the year, we'll uh, cut back some helpers and, and uh, put some crew leaders together. And I think we're running 21 or 22 right now because it's just the dry time of the year. But um, what we found is that we have a service manager and they can usually run three to five service trucks. Um, and that's keeping them supplied, inspecting the work, just making sure that everything gets done uh, properly. So three to five crews is what uh, we find a service manager can run. Um, so, and when uh, you say service, so most people when they think service manager, they think of the person that's the boss of the department. You're really talking about more of a like a superintendent role with that. Yes. Yeah. We have we have uh, five service superintendents that oversee all of our service work. We have seven people in the office that are doing everything from um, estimating to dispatching to billing to collection to scheduling. There you go. Thank you. This is a great question for you, Greg. What is the best way to handle a prospect that doesn't want to meet to discuss the proposal? They just want you to email the proposal. You know, pri prior to um, prior to COVID, I would tell them that that. I'm probably not the right person for you because if, if all you're doing is, is shopping for a price, I mean, how, 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 how much do you really know about roofing? Because if you're just shopping on the, you know, on the right side of the menu and just looking at price, I'm probably not the right guy for you. And, and that comes down to, you really need to do a, a good pre-qualification up front and, and say, um, all right, after I've, done this, I'd like to come in and sit down with you and really talk about what's going on on your roof. Now, what, what ends up happening with service is you make, you, you got to make the sale that first time. And once you build a relationship, it's like Norman. Norman has relationships with, with clients where he hasn't seen them maybe in a year or two, but they, they just, they trust him and he'll send his proposal over and he, and he closes, you know, the majority of, it, of his proposals. But um, service you, you have to make a sale one time, maybe two or three to right. just earn the relationship. And then after that, I, I think it's okay to send the proposal. All right. When you got a client, right? They trust yeah. you. It's an account. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, okay, cool. We get a question about follow-up, providing an invoicing option. Uh, grab a demo. Anthony, I would encourage you to grab a demo, see how they can help. Greg, do you have another question for Mr. Wallach here? So... <clears throat> Greg, if you had to start all over again from scratch and you had one truck, 
one service truck. What are you going to do to get, where are you going to put your attention to get to two, to get to three? Uh, one account at a time. You know, just, you just, it, it I got to tell you to grow service, you got to be patient. It, it, it's not, it's not a, a get rich quick scheme. You know, it's, it's, it, what it does is it, you, you'll build a great base of clients over a long period of time, as long as you continue to do a great job servicing them. And, and what that does is that feeds your roof replacement business if you're smart. And, and I got to tell you, that's a transition, you know, uh, that it has to be very gently uh, orchestrated. A lot of times you can piss a client off by not fixing his leak right, and then you don't even get invited to the roof replacement. So, you know, you really have to be a professional in the way that you manage that relationship and, and be communicating with clients when they get to a point where that roof is just, uh, you know, I, it, it's going to leak. I, I'll try to fix it, but it's just, you know, your roof is gone and you just got to sometimes have that, um, that, that real tough conversation with a client. Yeah. You're well, going to, you're going to get, you're going to get blamed if you don't. So, so we're given the fact that we're taking one client at a time. We're, we're trying to do an amazing job. We're giving them the pickle if they think you're wrong and that you, you want them to be like, you're giving them the pickle. I mean, you're, you're doing this, you're full steam ahead and you're, you're doing 80% of your revenues from re-roofing. What would you guys, what would you say you're doing with all these variables working? Cause this isn't going to translate for everybody. What's your close rate on re-roofing as a result um, of all this? One out of three. That's fantastic for That's construction great. sales. And and speak a little bit about when you uh, sell a re-roof, how you wrap maintenance into that. Um, every every roof replacement that we do um, comes with a warranty that requires maintenance, just like the manufacturer requires. So what we do is we uh, at, at, when we're selling the job, we're letting them know up front. We're going to give you a, a manufacturer's warranty. We're going to give you a best roofing warranty. And, and to keep your manufacturer's warranty in place, you can see here in this little fine print, it, it says we want to see an ongoing maintenance program. So, you know, the sales guys, you know, make sure that they understand that up and on the front end, which pretty much everybody forgets. Um, and then when we get done with the project, what we do is we have one of our business development girls, very nice presentable person take a closeout book to the client. Um, we found this is one of the best investments that we could ever do. We, we, take, uh, we take a three ring binder. We also give it to them in a thumb drive um, and we walk them through, here was your contract. Here's your permit closed out. Here's your maintenance agreement. Here's your warranty. Um, here's what you do if you have a problem. Um, and, and then we usually take a, what we call a Jake cake Jake is our, our company mascot. It's a, it's a, it's a cake that's been, my wife makes them. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really uniquely packaged, looks like a dog and it just gives a little bit of personality and, um, people are shocked when they get something personalized from, you know, from you. And it's got a little story about, about Jake and, and on it and, and the company and what we try to accomplish. And, we just try to make it personal and, and, and build a relationship with a client. I just want to, as, as we're wrapping up, we have some more questions that we're just not going to be able to get to. Um, if, if any first for thank finally here as we're wrapping up, thank you, Greg, you're, you're amazing. Uh, yes, thanks, you, Greg. You're an incredible you. person as you are a businessman. Yes. And I'm grateful to have you on today. We love you. Everybody here, we have 143 people sitting on listening to you share. So that's a lot, uh, at least for commercial roofing webinars. Um, we want to just ask, is there a way for someone to ask you a question um, uh, and get, get some additional support or, you know, not support, but just a quick answer. I know you're super busy. Uh, does anybody have access to ask you a question um, and, and how can they get in touch with you? Um, my email is G. W A L L I C K at bestroofing.net. Um, you know, I'll try to get back to you as quick as I can. Um, so yeah, if you want to drop me an email, I'm happy to, to help you. Yeah. And I'll just make a comment. I, I, I was in the, the ecosystem of best roofing for, for four and a half years. And I can tell you that 
one thing that that never changed was that there was always change <laughs> however you say that with that quote greg is an incredible uh evolver and adapter and i think that just the spirit of being being growth minded always finding something to solve it's a journey it's not a formula that you just plug in you know using follow up will open up a world of answers using stg working with some greg Greg Wallach, I just know you've always surrounded yourself with great people. Uh, you've you've t- you've taken your time to do the right thing, and you're always trying to to solve a bigger picture that helps you long term. And I think that's what I've noticed uh, that stuck out to me the most is that uh, this is a business that happens to do roofing and you do the right thing. It's a people business, and you just have a ton of fun building your business and solving problems and upgrading something and optimizing something, and all these ideas just come creatively. And why I say that is because I like to see more clients instead of saying, hey, what's working for you? Have more of the thought that says, how do we solve this? And they, they, they're originally coming up with something. And I think I see you originally coming up with something often just because you're trying to solve a problem that's exposed itself in front of you. And yeah. Here, here's one of the last things I want to leave, leave with you is um, everybody, in, not everybody, but most people in your company want to see themselves somewhere else tomorrow. So one of the things that I do out of just my own fear is I'm fanatical about wanting to grow my business because if I'm not creating opportunities for my good people, guess what? My good people are going to go someplace where they can find an an opportunity. So, you know, I'm going to encourage every one of you to really think, you know, I I strategically like to think about growing 10 to 15% a year. Uh, or, or try to try to do that just so that I can uh, give people a career path. Wonderful. And you've done that with hundreds and hundreds of people, um, me being one of them. So thank you uh, so much and reach out everyone. G Wallach at bestroofing.net. Make sure you reach out to Greg Hain. If you are interested in being in a peer group, learning how to get into commercial, start or grow your, or grow your current business and service, um, and if you're real lucky, he might do an EOS implementation with you. If you're looking <laughs> for follow-up CRM and a way to track and manage, jump in, take a look. I sold it for four and a half years. It's still at the top of my list for sales management CRMs. Uh, it's very, very important for you to use it or something like it. It's hard to compare with because they've done such a good job for the contracting business. And of course, if you're not training and coaching your salespeople to do what Greg had mentioned, ask the right questions. How do you engage a client? How do you present yourself? Uh, What's the whole culture look like and need to feel like? You need help with that. I can accelerate that process because I learned uh, much of what I teach from the best uh, uh, over here, Greg. And so thank you all again for joining. Hey, Uh, Ryan, I I, I gotta throw my two cents in. Greg Wallach often speaks at trade shows at the IRE. And when I have people come up to me and this is the last couple of times that he's been speaking opposite to me, I tell people, go listen to him. He's, he is more unique and hard to get a hold of. But the other thing I would encourage you to do is after he's done, go up and talk to him. Greg is a genuinely nice human being. He has tremendous humility and he wants to help people. And don't be intimidated because he's standing up on a stage. He is a, he's a good hearted human being, and he'll be glad to meet you where you are and give you the genuine best advice he can. So take advantage of that. Fantastic. Love you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Eric. Bye, everyone. Thank you all for coming. See See you. Bye.